Well, this is a pretty busy intersection here in Westboro, Mass, Jeff. So what are we looking for? Well, in this case, we're looking for a who, not a what, here by the intersection of East Main and Lyman Streets. All right, then who are we looking for? Well, you've heard the story of Robin Hood, right? Of course. He stole from the rich to give to the poor. Right. But Robin Hood is a story from old England, not New England. Yeah, I get that. But this guy may have a lot to do with the British character that you know and love. So today we're in search of a man named Tom Cook, who was once considered the Robin Hood of Massachusetts. And they say he once made a deal with the devil. Hello, I'm Jeff Belanger, and welcome to episode 116 of the New England Legends podcast. If you give us about 10 minutes, we'll give you something strange to talk about today. And I'm Ray Osher. Thanks for joining us on our mission to chronicle every legend in New England, one week and one story at a time. And we couldn't do it without you and the help of our Patreon patrons. So true. This show has been uh, growing, Jeff. It has. Huge. But the costs continue to rise. And it's our patrons who keep us going, so we want to thank them for that. If you'd like to give back, plus get access to new episodes and hear bonus episodes that no one else gets to hear, head on over to patreon.com slash New England Legends. And for just three bucks per month, you could join the team. That's right. That's the price of a coffee each month. That's all it is. And we also appreciate it when you post a review of our show on iTunes or wherever you listen to us. Those reviews go a long, long way in helping others find us in this crowded sea of podcasts. All right, Jeff. So we're looking for Tom Cook, a Robin Hood type of character, here by the corner of Lyman and East Main Street? That's right. Though there are some Robin Hood scholars in the United Kingdom who will tell you that maybe it was actually Tom Cook who played a significant role in the reputation of Robin Hood. Really? Not not the other way around? Mr. Cook isn't someone we'll run into now, but he was born in a house that once stood right about here. To set this up, let's head back to 1738. It's October 6th, 1738, and little Tom Cook has just come into the world. Tom is the son of Cornelius Cook, a blacksmith here in Westboro, and his wife Eunice. Some say maybe he was born under a bad sign. Others say time will tell. When little Tom was only three years old, he falls gravely ill. The doctors aren't quite sure what's wrong with him, but Cornelius and Eunice fear they may lose him. The town parson, Dr. Parkman, and the deacons pray over the young child. Lord, Lord, hear hear our prayer. prayer. They pray for the Lord's will, but that's not good enough for Mother Eunice. She's desperate. Only spare his life. I care not what he becomes. And that little statement alarms the deacons. (gasps) To the deacons, that sounds a lot like offering little Tom's soul to the devil in exchange for health. Soon, Parson Parkman and his deacons grow even more concerned when young Tom makes a speedy and complete recovery. Right, because that sounds awful. (laughs) Well, they are a superstitious bunch. Maybe they have good reason to be superstitious because as Tom grows up, he's becoming quite the terror. We're talking beyond normal boy mischief, too. Soon, friends and neighbors think maybe there really is some sinister pack with the devil. When Tom turns 13 years old, the devil comes calling one morning while he's getting dressed. The old scratch is tired of Tom living in Westboro. He figures it's time to take him down below. Tom is petrified at the sight of the devil in his house, but he keeps his head. You see, Tom's pretty clever. The devil reaches out his blackened hand, offering it to Tom, who's still pulling on his shirt. And that's when Tom thinks quick. Ah, come on! Can you at least wait until I get my suspenders on? The devil sighs, then nods. And that's when Tom picks up his suspenders and tosses them into a nearby fireplace. The suspenders burn up, and Tom vows never to wear them again. The devil is furious at being outsmarted by a kid. With no suspenders, there's no way to take Tom below. So in a sense, Tom is free from the devil's grip so long as he doesn't wear suspenders. Which seems like a small price to pay. (laughs) And having already faced down the devil at a young age, Tom is pretty much free from religious dogmas as well. It's not long after this incident that Tom Cook begins his life of crime. But Tom isn't some ordinary thief. He's not just lining his pockets. He seems to have a more noble calling. Alice Morse Earl writes a book called Stagecoach and Tavern Days, where she describes the way Tom is perceived. He steals from the rich and well-to-do with the greatest boldness and dexterity, equaled by the kindness and delicacy of feeling shown in the bestowal of booty upon the poor and needy. 
He steals the dinner from the wealthy farmer's kitchen and drops it in the kettle or on the spit in a poor man's house. He steals meal and grain from passing wagons and gives it away before the driver's eyes. The thing is, Tom Cook is getting known all over New England. The kids love him because he always seems to have toys, food, and money to give them. And apparently, he's a pretty fetching man. Alice Earle describes him. Tom Cook is most attractive in personal appearance, agile, well-formed, well-featured, with eyes of deepest blue, most piercing yet most kindly in expression. He does sound dreamy. (laughs) He does. (laughs) But those older folks around town, they don't like him too much. All right, why is that? Well, for one, he charges the wealthy area farmers a fee, you, you know, for... Protection. Right, protection. I, I'm guessing from himself. Exactly. Tom Cook isn't just a thief. He's also committed arson at a few properties if, you know, he needs to send a louder message. I believe the term for this is extortion. And I believe you're right. <laughs> but then something happens to Tom Cook, and it's something that happens to many career criminals. He gets caught. He gets caught. Right. For the crimes of arson, extortion, and repeated theft, the judge shows no mercy. I therefore sentence you to be hanged by the neck till you're dead, dead, dead. Tom Cook is quick to offer the judge a cheerful reply. I shall not be there on that day, day, day. And true to his word, when execution day arrives, his prison cell is empty. I'm sure he had plenty of help along the way. When you steal from the rich and give to the poor, I imagine that tends to win you a lot of fans. Mm, That it does. Tom Cook's biggest trouble, though, is yet to come. Now that day arrives when Tom swipes a goose from a farmer's wagon as he's making his way to the market. Tom slips into an abandoned schoolhouse near Brookline and lights a small fire in the stove to cook the goose. Where there's fire, there's smoke. So true. Some nearby farmers see smoke rising from the chimney of the abandoned schoolhouse, so they investigate. When they find Tom Cook inside, it's his goose who is now cooked. The farmers bring Tom to a nearby tavern just filled with wealthy farmers who've been robbed by Cook. And they give Tom a choice. He can either face a judge again for his crimes or face the gauntlet of the assembled men who are ready with whips and fists to settle the score. Tom, he chooses the gauntlet. And after that, we don't hear too much more about Tom Cook. He just drifts into legend. And that brings us back to today. Okay, Tom Cook's story does sound a lot like every version of Robin Hood that I've ever encountered. Yeah, I get that. He's only missing the band of merry men. Right. but, But it turns out we know a lot more about the historical Tom Cook than we do about Robin Hood. Okay, when we researched Robin Hood, I learned a lot. Yeah, me too. First, first I always assumed that he was a real historic figure in England. Well, that's the thing. I mean, he may have been, but it's cloudy at best. The character of Robin Hood begins to show up around the 15th century in ballads and poems as part of May Day celebrations. The idea of Robin Hood was actually born about a century earlier during a time when there's this great discontent in England. I mean, the feudal system is just falling apart. The gap between the haves and the have-nots is huge, and the have-nots are getting pretty tired and desperate. The earliest stories of the Robin Hood figure are that of this rebel from Sherwood Forest, a man hell-bent on destroying the establishment, so he murders the agents of the government and the wealthy landowners. Centuries later, the story softens to that of a man who himself is an aristocrat, who sees the wrong in the system. So he goes about trying to change things. He redistributes his wealth and encourages others to do the same. Even later versions would add a love interest in Maid Marian. Sure. Then the Merry Men, and the story changed from murdering aristocrats to stealing from the wealthy to give to the poor. Now, various scholars believe the version of Robin Hood we know so well, the guy who steals from the rich to give to the poor, is from the American influence on the centuries-old story and legend. In 1795, Joseph Ritson, a British antiquarian, publishes a collection of Robin Hood stories called Robin Hood, a collection of all the ancient poems, songs, and ballads. And the work propels Robin Hood back into the mainstream. 1795 is not that long after Tom Cook's time. Right. It makes sense that the Cook story would mix and blend with the Robin Hood story when you look at it from an American perspective. Exactly. Yeah, it's kind of amazing to think this thief from Massachusetts who once tricked the devil is the real inspiration behind the Robin Hood we've seen in so many books, movies, and even cartoons. And it all began from this street corner in Westboro, Massachusetts. So I wonder how many people drive by this intersection and have no idea just how significant this place is. Yeah. I mean, really, globally. Right. I mean, wow, maybe Robin Hood 
was really born in Westboro, Massachusetts, not Sherwood Forest. I know what you mean, Ray. I love it when huge legends hide in plain sight. And we love it when you legendary listeners don't hide at all. No. We love hearing your feedback on the episodes. You can get in touch with us by calling or texting our legend line anytime at 617-444-9683. You can also leave a voicemail with our show closing or connect with us on our website at ournewenglandlegends.com. Join our super secret Facebook group or find Jeff and I on social media like Twitter and Instagram. We'd like to thank Wendy Lynn Stotts from the band Sunspot. They're awesome. And Jack Osier from Jokes by Jack. He's awesome. He is awesome, of course. He's your kid. Sophie Belanger. She's awesome. She's my kid, right? Plus Lorna Nagara and Michael Leggy, who are both awesome and have helped us so many times before Woo. with voice acting talent. And of course, our theme music is by John Judd. Hi, this is Isaac McDonald from Nova Scotia, Canada. Until next time, remember, the bizarre is closer than you think.